I hope everyone attended yesterday's talk on R, right? So uh, we have done some basics now, right? You all got familiar with R. Uh, spent some time building, say, three or four models. Uh, this talk again focused on machine learning, uh, but the idea is that yesterday we cover a breadth of machine learning, right? We uh, dwelled into multiple models. Uh, this time we'll do sort of a depth, right? So we go from both perspectives. Uh, second, uh, yesterday we focused mainly on classification models. Uh, I'll try to see if, uh, apart from classification, we can cover some unsupervised material today, right? It's, it's also important to have uh, that worldview also. Uh, third, why is this focused on Python? It's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing uh, there to compare between Python and R. Both are great tools. I happen to use R and Python every day in my work. It's just to give you a wider set of options, right? It's, so you find R bit uncomfortable to use. Here is another tool, Python. Just see if that is helpful, right? So the idea is to not focus on tools. We'll focus on the concepts, and tools are just the means to get there, right? So uh, with this thought, uh, let me begin. Oh, by the way, people on this side, is this visible to you, or you may want to share? Okay, a uh, bit. Small introduction, uh, my name is Harsha. I work out of a startup called Sukarati, uh, which is based in Pune. Uh, we are an advertising domain startup. Okay, and uh, so being an advertising company, we keep on getting a lot of click stream and impression level data. And my job there is to make sense out of this data. Uh, so we have done introductions yesterday. I wouldn't spend time on that. Okay, so let's let's get on. Okay, uh, so uh, if you think about the whole agenda of the workshops and the conference, uh, the idea is something similar to this. Uh, so machine learning or analytics world, uh, overall, if you look at the big picture, uh, there are these different ideas, right? There are these mathematical tools. Uh, sorry, there are these mathematical models, the theory, then there are these tools, then there is the business knowledge. The idea is it's not enough to have knowledge of only one part of it, right? It's, it's more like an orchestra. You need to know, be a jack of all trades there. Uh, so one is the science part of machine learning, right? So when you say that the library is fitting a logistic regression model, what is the library doing exactly, right? Knowing that is important. That is the science part of machine learning. Second is the process. If you are given a business problem with a lot of data thrown at you, how do you begin? And how do you go to making a usable solution out of it? Then there comes the engineering part, right? So this data that we are talking about, it could be billions of data points. It could be coming from multiple sources. How do you store that? That's, that's more of the engineering aspect of machine learning or analytics. And the last is art, right? Black magic. Uh, or more, more importantly, art of machine learning is about uh, how do you come up with a better model of the problem, right? The real world that you're trying to model, how do you come up with a better data model for that? So conference talks would be mostly focused on engineering. Uh, the end talk, right? Don't miss out on that. Uh, so Shailesh sir is going to talking uh, about uh, art of machine learning. Uh, yesterday's talk on R, I think we covered a lot on science part. Okay, so today what we are going to do is we are going to focus on process of machine learning. Now, process sounds a very bureaucratic word, and as as a community, we would hate uh, problems. So, what is this process of machine learning? Uh, we are going to take a real world challenging problem, not a toy data set. Uh, we'll we'll spend some time on the science and the tools. Uh, use some intuition. Uh, so I'm taking a problem which will be very simple for everyone to understand, and then see if we can create a usable solution out of it. Right. So that is process of machine learning. Uh, so what is this process that we are speaking about? Right. So imagine this case that you are working for an organization, and they throw a data set at you. Uh, which says that, hey, uh, we have done some telemarketing exercise six months back, and here are a bunch of data points from that exercise. Okay, and that marketing campaign was somewhat successful, 
but can you tell us something more what should we do better next time right can you do something using machine learning to tell us uh, a better way to do our marketing campaigns right very simple problem apply you know applicable to all domains so now if as a data scientist someone throws this kind of question at you you would have a flurry of questions in your mind right where do i start that's that's the biggest problem what kind of models am i supposed to use the data that is being provided to me is it too small is it too large how do i even know what is useful or what is enough size of that data set right so process is a somewhat scientific way of understanding and answering these questions and going to a usable solution right so these are more uh, derived uh, out of the experience of community if i don't know if you have uh, heard of these uh, non open source tools like saas and startup uh, which are again used in analytics community they they uh, tend to have some notion uh, associated with this pro process called as crisp dim and there there, there is bunch of terminology associated with that but the basic idea is you you need to have a well defined process of going starting from a data set and going to a solution right so that is what we are going to focus on today science is covered and art and engineering i hope the conference talks are going to cover that okay uh, so when we go to a typical uh, machine learning or analytics problem process uh, these are these are the steps that invariably we would go through one is we start off with defining what is it that we want to achieve right defining the objective we need to get data right we need to get a lot of data uh the next part is called exploratory analysis where we try to get familiar with the data try to understand what is being thrown at us uh then we come to the meaty part which is the modeling of that data here all the science of machine learning comes into picture we need to evaluate the model it's it's not just enough to throw data into a library build some model and just get on with it right we need to see actually whether the model that we have built is it good enough right that is the evaluation part and what i have observed from my experience is after evaluation you always have to go back right there is it's an iterative process it's highly unlikely in fact it's impossible that you'd get to a uh, great working solution in the first attempt right we'll we'll need to keep on iterating uh, and tweak our model tweak our parameters come up with more features go back and say after three or four iterations hopefully we'll come to a usable solution and the, and the next part is we need to keep on validating if you build a model today because the world outside is changing so fast uh, you need to constantly keep on evaluating your model with newer data and the moment you feel that it is not doing the work that it was supposed to do we need to go back to the iteration again right so uh, in this talk we'll talk about objective setting very briefly uh, mostly i'll be focusing on exploration modeling evaluation and iteration uh, get data is not covered here right because one it is too diverse a problem it really depends on the application domain in which you are working how is your organization storing the data nonetheless i have another talk in a conference uh, tomorrow afternoon so if some of you are interested do join for that talk where i'll spend some time on how do you get the data in shape right so that's for tomorrow okay Uh, so now let's start with the hands on right so today i'm not going to spend too much time on the uh, discussion uh, we had a lot of it very interesting yesterday so let's get on with the hands on uh, we need this particular data set called marketing campaign data how many of you don't have it just raise your hands bank phone csv right so if couple of you are not having this data set one is a github repo uh, those who are familiar with it you can fork this repo uh this presentation is an html file which is also shared in that repository and the data set okay uh those who are not familiar with jit you can just google for uh, bank marketing data set uci machine learning so uci machine learning has this open source repository of machine learning data sets i have taken one very interesting data set from uh, their repository right so i'll give couple of minutes for those who want to download the data Can you go back to your own? Yeah, this is it. 
Yes. So this is the UCI machine learning repository. If you have JIT installed, you can fork this repository. It has the presentation HTML file. So those who are familiar with JIT, I'll urge you to do this. Uh, that will save you some time of copy pasting the code. Or that will save you the time of typing the code. You can just copy paste that code on Python console. All right, and just keep this link handy even after the workshop if you want to go back to some material or if you're not able to follow along, if you get missed out on some commands, the whole presentation is there with all the code. So you can keep going back to it. If you find some errors or if you find some better insights, do point it out, I'll, I'll incorporate that. All right. Uh, so what is this data set about? Uh, so this was a paper published by uh, uh, these Portuguese fellows, I guess they are professors at some university uh, and it's a data from a marketing campaign of a bank. Okay, What they tried to do is they tried to sell a deposit or a fixed deposit product to their customers and through telemarketing and the data that was gathered is they massaged that data a bit and that is uh, you know uh, open sourced. Uh, it's a very popular business problem lot of marketing companies uh, so this can be fitted to lot of uh, marketing business problems that uh, you face can we move on you have all the data yeah all right so uh, let's begin with the hands on so whenever we get a data the first thing that we need to do is read the data right so whatever tool that we are using it could be R Python or some other fancy thing out there uh, so what I'm doing here is numpy is a package for n-dimensional arrays in Python pandas is a package which gives you a data frame functionality so we must have worked with data frame yesterday on R so pandas lets you use data frames within Python okay so I'm <coughs> importing these two packages giving them an alias so that it's easy to refer. Uh, here what I'm doing is I'm setting up the path to my bank file. All right. So you could have this somewhere in your downloads location on your desktop. Just set up the correct path. This line is important. What I'm doing is I'm uh, you fire up your Python console. So if you are on Windows, open your Python. There will be some .exe. If you are on Linux, go to terminal and type Python. So, in the terminal, we will yes, type. Yes, yes, yes. How do you know the current working directory? How do you know the current working directory in Python? I guess there will be some command. Not, not sure. So, if I have to. No, no, so basically, what I am saying is just set the path of your file here in this link. To know the current directory, we will have to import a couple of more packages in Python and then set that. This is an easier way to do it, I guess. Okay. Yeah. This is which file? Which one is it? So there is this file called bank hyphen full dot. The bank is the no thing that code is in this which file in your GitHub. So there is an HTML file called presentation dot HTML. You can open it in your own browser and so this. You need to insert date today first. Is that so? Not sure. Just just try running this. See if or you are not able to import that at all. I think it should be fine. I don't think we are using date anywhere. So I'm using two point seven. Yes. Just open it in your browser. So there is a theme folder in the GitHub repo which contains the CSS and the JavaScript. You need to download that folder as well. Alright, uh, so everyone here? So what I am going to do is I am going to show you the code, give you some time for uh, typing that out or copy pasting and then I will run the same code in my Python console. Okay. Uh, so you must have downloaded the file somewhere, right? Just copy paste that the path to that file and put it in the stream, right? So 
So if you are on Windows, the top bar will let you copy that. All right, I'm just setting up that path to the file, and then I'm reading this file. Okay, it's a CSV file, uh, which is delimited by a semicolon, and I'm setting this header argument, which says that the file does have headers at the zeroth row. All right, so if you don't have headers, you set this to false. If you have some other delimiter, you change uh, this delimiter string. All right, so I'll just run this part now. Yes. No columns to pass. No columns? No columns to pass from file. So you need to download the theme folder. Yes, just open it in your browser. So the theme folder will be copied along with the presentation. Okay, folks, I'll, I'll just get to move here. Uh, let's not spend too much time. If someone is lagging behind, don't worry. All the code is there. You can you can follow along. Don't worry. Alright, so we are up to here, right? So whatever that file is, we have read that into this IND. You can give any other name that uh, you are comfortable with. So how do you access help on Python? It's very simple. You typically run a help function. So if you don't know what that read.csv is doing, uh, within the console itself, uh, you can call a help function on that particular command and it will print the whole a uh, bunch of options and everything about that function. <coughs> All right, so the moment we have read a data, uh, the next thing that uh, uh, the bike with the registration number in the eight four one four in your peers, there's some issue also here. This go there for a second. All right, so. Uh, whenever we have read a data, the first thing that we do is we do a top level view of that data, right? How many rows are there? And sorry, so hopefully this gives you a time to set up. My <laughs> this was planned. <laughs> All right, any questions? Just we can use this time. So pandas, pandas is a package for pandas. No, no, pandas is a general purpose analytics package. So what it lets you do is you can read table as a data frame and then keep on uh, subsetting that 
calculate information. Yes, yes, it's very similar to R. So in fact, it is supposed to replace R on Python code. Any other? Okay, so first thing that we need to do is we do a bit of handshake with the data. All right, we find out how many uh, rows and columns are there in the data set. Uh, what are the column names? What are the data types of each columns? Right. So. Uh, we break that in this IND. So, if you run the shape uh, argument of that object, uh, it says that there are 45,000 rows and there are 17 columns in this data. Okay. Uh, if you print the columns, uh, you would get to know something about this data set. What they are saying is uh, there are these. Uh, demographic kind of variables like education, <coughs> marital status, job, age. Then there are these bunch of others, and there is this one called y. This is something that we are interested <coughs> in predicting. Okay, so we said that it's a marketing campaign. This y variable says whether the customer responded to the campaign or not. All right. So uh, next step uh, after we have read the data is probably we want to get familiar with the outcome variable first. Uh, by the way, one tip is, uh, so whenever you read this shape argument, right, the first thing that you should be thinking about is how many rows do I have, how many columns do I have. All right, so if you end up with a file with say only 100 variables and 100 rows in that, probably for a real world problem it's too small. Or say the number of columns are more than the number of rows. That is called an overdetermined system, right? You just have to too many number of columns and small number of data points. So these are so it, it looks like a very simple command, but nonetheless very useful, right? Uh, so now uh, we know what are the columns are there. Why is our output variable, right? So if you run this method called describe, what pandas does is it tells you something about that particular variable. So what it is saying here is that uh, there are forty-five thousand entries for that variable. It has two unique values. Okay, so it's a categorical variable. Uh, the top out of those two, or the most frequently occurring, the mode of that particular column is no. That is, most of the people did not respond well to the marketing campaign, and that number is thirty-nine thousand. So, out of those forty-five thousand people, almost thirty-nine thousand nine hundred declined to accept that offer. Right. So, that's important to know. So why is that important? No. So if you are doing a classification kind of a problem, and if you end up with out of this forty-five thousand, say, except ten, everyone says no, then probably there is no use in fitting a model on that data, right? So generally, what happens is in a real-world classification problem, especially the ones in marketing, the number of respondents, the number of ones, is going to be always less. The data is going to be skewed. So we'll come to that problem as we progress along. So once we've run uh, this describe command, if you just want to know the unique values, here we just have two unique values, but if there are more, uh, you can call this unique method. It tells you that there are two uh, unique Presentation this seems to be made up for Mac. And my poor <laughs> Dell is not fitting there. Uh, so we have this unique values. After unique values, if you want to know the count of the number of entries by each unique level in a categorical variable, you run a method called as value counts. Don't worry about by hacking these methods. It's just important to know what is the sequence that you are following. Right, so we are at the top level, we are trying to gather top level information about the data. Now we have drilled down to the outcome variable. So now it says that, hey, uh, uh, there are 5,200 people who responded. That's, that's a good number. We can at least uh, start or we can at least attempt to build a model on top of this. 
All right. So the D type is so the first thing is the D type set object and then it's an execution for the that's a very good question. So he says that if I do a D type on my Y variable, here it says that the D type is object. Uh, but when I'm running my unique count or something, Here it says integer. So basically, this value count itself is another object, yes. which is just printing numbers. So this n64 is the data type of that object, okay. which was okay. printed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a small question. So if I'm doing ind dot uh, describe, yes. So then uh, it's throwing up data in a different format. Is that so? Yes. Just that. And not all the things. So ind is a data frame. That's good actually. So what it is doing is IND is a table, right, which has number of columns in it. So what it has done is it has printed the describe command output on every column. Or at least the ones which are numeric. Yeah, so I got that. So, so what I wanted to ask is so once you say IND Y, it's not a data frame anymore. No, it's a series. So it's a series of numbers. Yes. Which is why it's Okay. So basically you can think of a data frame as a heterogeneous collection of arrays, right? So when you access the Y individual column, it's just an array of numbers or array of strings. And IND is something that is holding up all those this heterogeneous collection of arrays together. Yeah, I understand that. Okay. And but it's not this is also not this way, uh, Y. Yes, because it's categorical. Right? So but we can individually access that. And uh, while subsetting also, so inside the square brackets, you could uh, put on the rows. So we'll come to we'll come to that. Thanks. Okay, so we are done with the handshake. We are done with reading the data. So let's go to the second date with our data. Okay. So we have got some idea about how many rows are there, how many columns, what kind of <coughs> data types they are holding. Now we go to individual observations. Right. So uh, head and tail uh, standard commands. Uh, this is something important. Uh, that tends to confuse people coming from R background. So in R, what happens is if you have a data frame, okay, you can give two arguments for subsetting. The first one deals with number of rows that you want to select. Second one deals with the number of columns. But I think Pandas does something different. So if I use this kind of subsetting, what it is saying is starting from row number one up to 10, this is not right inclusive. So it will not show the tenth row from this data set. Print that. Okay. So this is similar to R, but for columns, you need to do something different. Uh, it starts from zero, no? Uh, I'm not sure. No. Starts from one. So they're following the R convention. They're not. Start seems to be starting from zero. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to just check the first sorry. First say first ten, so I should zero to ten. Alright? So starting from zero, uh, I want rows up to Time, it will it is not right inclusive so this is how you subset your rows right so you get a feel of the initial few observations of a data frame you can also do a command called head and supply the number of rows that you want to print that should also work you can also do a tail on that these are pretty standard just some ways of getting familiar with the data now, if I want to, uh, and the objects that are getting returned are in turn again data frames. So you can take them and assign it to a different variable and work on that. Okay. They uh, are, yes, they are data frames. So basically, if you're subsetting by rows, is clear data set, and if you're subsetting by columns, it's not a data frame. Yes. Okay. 
So basically, that's a strange area to follow. Sorry, this is a data frame again. So I'll, I'll come to the column subset default now. So here we said that I want number of rows. You invoke something called dot ix, which is a format for subsetting rows as well as columns. So now if I want to say print up to the first five rows, and I want to print, say, only the second column. <coughs> Something like that should work. All right. So this is what I was saying is different from R. In R, I don't think you need that ix thing. You can. Uh, so this number of column selection will work on the column side also. I can say give me starting from one up to five, except five. And because these columns the first parameter is number of rows. Yes. It's a range of number of rows. From zero to five. Yes. So if you eliminate the first argument it will start from zeros. And go up to <coughs> N minus one. <coughs> it's literally over where I mean when you subset both the rows and the columns. The type is still coming out to be data. Yes. So, uh, actually, I figured out they're copying R exactly. So if your sub if your subset is a linear, is a single list, then it loses all the data frame information and becomes a series. So even if it is just one row or just one <coughs> column, it's not a data frame anymore. But if you're sub if you're extracting two columns or two, this rows, is what you're talking about. Uh, so just set selecting one column. Yeah, selecting one column. This should be a series. I think this would be a series. Yes. So series is a single array. Yeah, single column, single so vector, is a array. Otherwise, it's still a data frame. Yes. Uh, so uh, we were. Uh -huh. So now, uh, because the columns are named, you can also give a list of columns that you want to select. And it should print that. And remember, this is a list of columns. In R, you do something called as you use the C concatenation function uh, to give a list of names. All right. So we've got so using me this method. We can actually change the order of the columns as well. Right? No, it's it's kind of immutable. It is returning another data frame. Yeah. It's not touching the original one. Yeah, okay, it's not. But in the return data frame, the order yes. is changed. Yes. Yes. You can give any order that you want. All right. In columns, be specified as a range. <laughs> columns can be specified as a range. So yes. So that's what we did a couple of minutes back. <coughs> so here I can specify something like this. All right. But probably using them with a name is a good idea. All right. We are always clear about what we are doing. Can we have the colon file? It will give all the rows. What? Can you leave out the yes, one? if you leave out the first argument, it will. Uh, so you don't have to leave out. You just have to specify an empty colon, colon with no other arguments on left and right. Okay, you can just so leave out the comma like R. So instead of comma, you just keep a colon here, and then. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's let's move on. I have a yes. very basic question. Yes, so all these things that you have done. Oh. Yes. You need tape to. Do you want to put tape on it? No, I'll remove the mic. <laughs> Yes, someone had a question here. Yeah. So <coughs> these things that you are showing, are you preparing the data set for further analysis? Yes. So basically when you get a data set, you are not sure about what has been thrown at you, right? Might be pulled by someone else in your organization. Then it would be a good idea to at least understand how many rows do you have, 
what are the columns what are the data types of that column and subsetting i'm just giving it as more uh, as a practice of working with uh, data frames in python so now we are just getting familiar with the data yes <coughs> We have not gone to machine learning yet, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we have covered this part, right? So we uh, we have taken a look at what is the output variable looking like. Uh, now, if you have some numeric variables, uh, the good, the basic thing that you can do is you can try to summarize that, calculating the average, the median of that data, describe that, okay? Uh, so we'll, we'll try that now. So we have this variable called age, all right? So the important part to know would be uh, what is the average age of the customers that we are looking at. Print <coughs> something like, I would say 41 years. Median, median is a midpoint of your data. Median turns out to be around 39. Okay, if you run describe, it prints out few other uh, quantiles or some other percentiles of the data, it prints out the standard deviation, minimum, maximum, all right? So uh, if you think about it, the minimum age is 18 and the maximum age is 95. Slightly weird, right? For a marketing campaign, uh, calling out a 95 year old guy and asking him that you want to put a deposit for 10 years, <laughs> I don't know if he'll be interested or not, right? Uh, so, okay, there is another, uh, if we, check the columns here. Uh, there is this another variable called balance. Okay, so I'm just keep I'm just taking a few variables. You can try the other ones. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the average of balance. So what this balance variable is telling is these are bank customers, right? How much balance do they have in their account? That turns out to be around 1300 in the Portuguese currency. So this is a Portuguese data, by the way. And if you take the median of this data set, that comes out to be around 448, right? Uh, so when you're doing this initial exploration, uh, this is something that is a good thumb rule of understanding whether your variables are imbalanced. Right, so in case of age, we saw that the median is 39 and the average is 41, right? They are pretty close. On the other hand, if you look at the balance, the <coughs> average is around 1300, but the median is 448. So there are some outliers in this data on the higher end of the spectrum. There is some Bill Gates there with a lot of balance in his account, which is pulling uh, the average of the data set to one end, right? So these, these little checks are very important, right? So we are doing it for one variable at a time. You can set up a loop probably uh, to print this in some nice form and then look at that report to get a mental feel of which variables might be affected by outliers. Uh, another thing that I've observed from my personal experience is man-made variables, right? Money is a man-made concept. It is more likely to have a skewed distribution. Age, it's natural, right? So if you have age data, Skewed distributions, probably we wouldn't find them, but man-made variables, share market returns, right? We can expect skewed, skewed. It's something, uh, I don't know how to explain that, but a good mental check there. Okay, so we are done with that. Uh, so uh, the next part is how do you dissect a single variable? Just now we have checked that the balance variable seems to be having some issues with that. Uh, so we can use percentiles right so we are all we all are familiar with percentiles uh, they sort of indicate a rank in a sorted data uh, so what we are going to do is for that balance variable let's try to find out percentiles uh, so we need a sequence of percentiles that we want to check all right so starting from zero i want to print percentiles of 200 or 1 with a step size of 0 0.1 so there is this NPy package, NumPy package that we loaded, it gives you gives us that sequence, but turns out that it is not right inclusive. So this is what I do. Okay. So these are the percentiles that we want to print. I'm just creating the sequence of percentiles, and then we take this balance variable here, line number five, 
and then I run a command called quantile or I invoke a method called quantile on that and which quantiles do I want to pick? I am giving a sequence here. Alright, so, so a simpler example would be that I want to know the 90th percentile of the balance variable. You can invoke the quantile method with the required percentile. So 90th percentile of bank balance in this data is this. And if you want to print a range, which is something that we are trying to do here. All right. So even these checks are important, right? Now, another surprising pattern is there are negatives in the balance. Right now, for some application domains, it could be acceptable. If age was negative, it was certainly an outlier or some data issue. Right? Balance, I don't know. You can think of it as the bank is allowing probably an overdraft, and then some people are having a negative balance. And here, uh, if we look at the percentile till the end. Here is something important. The 90th percentile is at 3,500, but the maximum of the data is about 100,000. So there are these 10% wealthy guys out there uh, who have a huge balance in their bank account, and the rest are all other less mortals like us. Uh, all right, so we'll need some kind of a special treatment for these guys. All right, so. Dissecting a single variable, right? So we so look at the pattern. We first looked at the total number of rows columns, then we looked at few observations, and now we are dissecting a single variable. Yes. Why we did uh, the first step? NPA range not zero comma zero comma one comma point one. Then we did one point one. I just want to highlight that that A range is not right inclusive. So the first time you only get up to nine percent, maybe one hundred percent. I want. It started off showing 1.1. We would have asked, oh, why did you do it? Alright, so when I go up to 1, it will only print till 0.9. That's the only reason. Alright. Yes? Would it not be, I mean, easier, like, you see the data, visualize the data, and walk, 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 yes. walk, 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 so what I tend to do is I have some scripts written which will print this kind of report for all the variables. And then you can also put that those plots in a for loop and print them to a PDF file and then just look at those plots. Right? So for this workshop I wanted to keep the installation requirement minimal as possible. So I did not ask everyone to install matplotlib. Right? People would have shown, hey, 10 installation for workshop, we are not showing up. Uh, so, but I will show some graphs, uh, don't worry. Uh, now the important part is data transformations, alright, so whenever we get a data, it will rarely happen that the information is useful as it is, right, we need to take a variable and transform it to another variable, a very common requirement, uh, how do you do that in Python, I have a small demo here, now the y variable or the outcome variable is a string, right, what we are doing here is, I am defining a lookup, or a dictionary which says yes should be mapped to 1 and no should be mapped to 0. Why are we doing this? It becomes easy to take average. All right, Because this is like a response rate. I want to know the average response rate. Here what I am doing is I am saying create a new variable using this original variable by invoking a map method on that variable. Don't worry if this, if you are not familiar with Python. Uh, now what is map going to do is, for this variable, every row will be given to this temporary variable called x. And whatever transformation that you want to do, you can write that as an expression here. Right? Think of it as a doing map reduce in memory. So what I am doing is, for every row of y variable, it gets into x. I am looking that up in this dictionary and whatever is the result will be assigned back to this y dummy variable. Alright, so you want to copy this. Uh, any questions on this part? So this will add one more column to your data? Yes, exactly. So 
this is a very trivial example, but you can think of, you know, you can get creative with data transformations. We'll see some of more data transformation as we go along. So I'll just copy paste this part. Just, just a second. Yes? See, int y is not a data frame anymore. So exactly. Right. So this is not really applying it to every row. It's applying it to every number inside the series. Or you can think of, yes, a row inside that series or each observation. It's not a data frame. Yeah, my bad. Right. So y is a series. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. So y is a series. So this map is doing it to every observation in that series. All right, so now we have this new... Oh, just a small question. Yes. So is it possible to do something like, you know, on the left hand side, I could say end of y and h, so put two variables. Then on the right hand side, I take uh, a data frame slice of two columns, then map this function on both of them. And can I do some, something like that? Yes, right hand side, mapping to both is doable. I do it row by row, then I assign it to the two columns. Assigning it to two columns, I'm not sure. You need to return a data frame and then concatenate it with the original one. Yeah, so I'll let you know. should, yes. there should be some way of doing it. Okay. Um, so we created this new variable to make it easy to calculate some stats. Right? So nothing uh, new here. So the average response rate is around 11 percent. All right. Uh, all clear with the transformation part because this is important. We are going to do slightly more complicated transformation next. All right. So now we go to the meaty part. So we have become familiar with the data, right? So we have had first two, three dates. Uh, now how do you proceed? All right. So depending on your application domain, you would have some gut feeling about what is going to matter, right? So we are dealing with a deposit product here which we are trying to sell. It's a financial product. If you think about it, deposits, <coughs> who buys deposits, right? If I have a lot of idle cash in my bank account, I might want to park that in a deposit and earn higher interest on it. All right, now do I have enough cash or do I have enough liquidity? That might depend on my age, right? If, if I'm 40 year old, I might have already invested that money in tons of other instruments in real estate. So you might have a gut feeling that the demographics variable will matter, right? So that's a hypothesis that we would want to check. Marital status, does it matter? I don't know. Uh, balance, loan, defaults. So this variable in the data set says whether the customer already has a loan on him, okay? And default is another yes, no variable which says has he defaulted on a loan? Now, if you think about it, uh, if you already have a loan, probably you would not invest in a deposit scheme, right? You might be already paying EMIs on that. So this is not a thumb rule, but you can, you know, think of it uh, default. If you, if the customer is already defaulting on a loan, that means probably he's, uh, he is uh, not having enough liquidity, right? It may not be wise to sell him a deposit product. All right. So this is the business aspect of machine learning, right? So here, no tool or no science is going to help us. So this initial line of attack, this will obviously be derived from our own application domain. So now let's do this. Uh, we, we need to find out whether age matters. I need to find out does age matter in combination with marital status. And I need to find out whether these variables are affecting the outcome, right? issue here with the image but uh, nonetheless I'll uh, basically try to explain. So when you want to uh, find out these kind of things whether variable x is affecting variable y, what you need to do is you need to take that variable y, aggregate it by the levels of variable x, right? That is the mental process that we tend to do. So that is called a split, apply and combine. You split your y variable based on x. Now to every one of those chunks, uh, you apply some transformation <coughs> and then you combine the resulting data set and then analyze that, right? So that is the flow that we are going to do here. 
All right. So I'll explain uh, what I'm doing here. So value count is just printing the unique values for my active status. Now, this newly created dummy variable, I'm saying take this and group it by the labels of marital status and assign it back to this object here and then print the average for each of this level. Simple? So let's, oh, sorry. So let's do this. So please stop me if something is not clear. So you're grouping by and then adding them? Or? So I'm taking a mean at each level. No, you before can the mean, just the second line. Give me my record. Here? Yeah. No, I'm just so this object is just storing this variable split by the levels of marital. It's not doing anything else. Oh, so it's just giving the grouping. And after that grouping. And you can run any other aggregation function or any reducer on top of that grouping. So I'll just copy paste this part. Alright, so now what we did, did is we grouped it by the marital status. So they have three different unique values for marital status. Apparently single people uh, are failing for their scheme for some reason. Uh, but this difference is not huge. So we knew that the average was around 11% and there is one group which is doing slightly better than the average. All right. So that is uh, basically grouping and aggregation by a single variable. Now we can get creative. I'm saying I'll take age of a person and his marital status, combine them, then I'll group my outcome by both of these variables and then try to see if the average is different. Right? This is very useful. So in your application domain, you could get creative take a combination of three variables, four variables. So after three, I guess it becomes slightly unlikely to uh, keep track of the results. All right, so, uh, and age groups, when I'm breaking down my age groups, what I'm doing is I'm not creating random groups. What I'm saying is, take my age variable, there is this command called Q cut, which is for quantile cutting. So for age variable, find out four quantiles, 25th, 58th, 75th and the top one and cut that variable and create a new variable called age bin and give give it these names, right? It's not that difficult, so let's just try out this part. All right, so what has happened is the original age variable, which was numeric, now it is converted to a categorical or category variable of four different chunks. And if you notice some pattern here, ideally one would expect equal number in each, right? Any thoughts on why the numbers differ? Because uh, the number of Exactly. So age is not strictly a real, right? It's, it's more like an integer variable. So even if say your quantile says that 25th percentile is age 30, uh, you might have a large number of people at age 25 or age 30, right? So that is why we are seeing a small discrepancy here. If we do this with a uh, more fine-grained variable with lots of real numbers, right? Uh, then you would expect equal number in each. So those who are curious uh, about what is this PDQ cut is doing, you can access the help. I'm skipping that part. Yeah. Sorry. Right, so it will print help say that quantile based discretization functions and blah blah blah. You can give a bunch of parameters to it. Alright, so 
Yes. What, what exactly are you doing here? So uh, we have age, okay, yes. which is a numeric variable which can take a large values from 18 to 95. Right. And I, I also have marital status, which is taking three variables, three distinct values. Now what I'm trying to do is that age variable, I'm grouping that into four chunks. And then there will be a combination of age into marital status. That will be what? Four into three, that is 12 levels. And then I'm seeing, so basically the hypothesis is that people who are married and their age, if you take both that into consideration, then their financial priorities would be different, right? And that is why whether they'll respond to a deposit scheme or not, is probably is going to matter. That is like a hypothesis which I which I want to test. So basically, exploratory analysis is all about uh, validating your gut feel, right? Whatever you think about your application domain, you just print this bunch of quick numbers and see whether that holds. All right. So everyone up to here. Uh, so what we did? So we have already binned our age variable. Now. I am creating a new group by variable where I am saying take the dummy and group it by a combination of marital, state, uh, marital status as well as age. Just, just a second. <coughs> by the way, Python is sensitive to white space, so you might see this errors when you copy paste. Yes, someone had a question here. Age has been sliced. So, uh, this Q so cut very huh? It's a numerical column which you divided by quantiles. So, this is age. Oh, I'm so sorry. So what it has done is 25th, 50th, 75 in the max, taken those as levels and then divided age into those four bins. All right? Yes. Then I ran this other command which says create a new group by object with a combination of these two. All right? And then now what, what I want to do is I want to check the average response rate in each category here. print something like this. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it slightly easier to use, uh, you use another method called unstack. Mm -hmm. All right. So here comes the meaty part. Young people who are single, mm -hmm. the average response rate in their category is 17%. That is huge, right? Because our average across all the observations is 11%. And within this category, it's 17%, that's 50% more. On the other hand, surprisingly middle age people who are married, they are not at all interested in this scheme. Probably they are invested at some, somewhere else. Right, so uh, the point that I'm trying to get across is, even if you don't have a fancy machine learning infrastructure or a data stack, even this exploratory analysis is good enough for you to get started. Right, this is a huge insight. Without worrying about building a model, if you can just give this insight to your marketing uh, team, they can get started. All right, they can just take their all all the customer data and just bin them into these groups, and then they would know that the first thing that they should try is telemarket to these guys. Here you're having the highest rate of return, and this ones probably should come last. All right, so that is what I'm, I'm trying to uh, highlight here. Every phase of machine learning is important. Don't rush to the final phase of you know uh, building a fancy model. All right, so we are done with grouping and aggregation outlier treatment. Uh, so we said that the balance variable seemed to be having some issues, right? There are some wealthy people uh, out there. Uh, so we checked this quantile part, okay? So quantiles which summarize distribution of a data are very helpful in finding out outliers. Uh, so, is this visible by the way? Or do you guys want to shift to the other end? Uh, 
Just go ahead. Sure. You can come here. There are a couple of seats there. <coughs> All right. So, uh, Matplotlib was not a prerequisite. So, those who don't have this installed, don't worry about it. I'm just trying to show you a couple of plots here. So, what I'm doing here, I'm doing the same old story. I'm taking quantiles of balance. And I want to see what is happening at the top end, right? If I just take the people who are between 90th percentile to the top end and then do a fine-grained uh, grouping or fine-grained uh, outcome on them and plot that, how is the distribution of balance looking like? Don't worry if you are not able to copy paste this. This is more of a visualization. Harshad, for me, quantiles with uh, range inside is not working. It's okay. giving a value error. Value error. I'll come to you. Let me just finish that one thing. Quantiles with? So quantiles with uh, the 10p arrays inside it is not working. Not working. Have you loaded anything? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I'll just check that. Yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, so this is a plot uh, where from 90th percentile of the balance to the end of the spectrum, we have plotted the bank balance. Now what you can see is, this is pretty smooth. And then I have a kink here. And the balance is shooting up. So what this is telling you is that these top 1% people, these wealthy guys, they are outliers. Right? And now if you think about this application domain, the financial priorities of these people might be different. They wouldn't probably buy a steam. Uh, on telecalling, right? They'll just outsource it to some financial planner who is handling their portfolio. Uh, so uh, this is a good way of finding out outliers in your data. Plot the distribution, quantiles, and plot, right? And then take a look at either end. So here we clearly see that there is some issue here uh, at about 99 percentile. So people above 99 percentiles are outlier. What we are going to do is we are going to remove them. So we had this data frame called IND. I'm going to subset that. So before that, we need to see the exact value of that 98th percentile. Oh, sorry. We need to select that variable. So about 13,000 uh, units. All right. So what we can say is that for this analysis, let's just filter out all people who have more than 13,000 in their balance. Sounds good? Uh, so the way to do that is pretty similar to what we did yesterday in R. You pick up that variable, and then you give it an operator. So basically, what we are saying is take this data frame and take this uh, another series of boolean objects. So basically when you run this, it is going to return a series of true and false and I am just subsetting my data. Now we originally had about uh, 45,200 observations. We are left with about 44,000. Right? But this is a good step. We have eliminated some outliers. Right? They might have uh, influenced our outcome. So outlier treatment, very important. Uh, there is another thing called missing data strategies, it's not visible, not covering that part. Uh, fortunately, this data turned out to be already massaged. It doesn't have many uh, missing observations. But in real world, I guess Bhargava covered this part, right? Uh, we can substitute by mean and median. Uh, we can build some fancy model to predict the missing values themselves. If the missing values for some column are very used, right? Say 60% of the data is missing, you might want to drop that column or at least at the start of your analysis, may not, you may not spend enough time on that. You can leave that for more advanced iterations. Uh, another uh, thing or another strategy could be you bin that variable and you keep missing as a separate bin. All right, if you think that the variable is very important, uh, I don't want to drop that column, but it has a lot of missing values. Uh, you can create that bin and keep missing as a separate bin. All right, so, okay, the most important part now. So we have uh, pretty much done with exploratory analysis. Uh, we have done a bit of 
outlier treatment. Uh, now something, uh, feature engineering is similar to data transformations. What you do is you uh, take your uh, gut feeling, your experience from your application domain and you try to create with new, come up with new features from existing features. So a uh, couple of slides back we had this uh, Eureka, right, that if age and marital status when they are combined and created to a new variable, there is a huge difference in the outcome. So why not make that as a new variable rather than keeping age and marital status separately. So what we do here is, I'm creating a new variable called life stage or give it any other name that you want. It will work on every row of that data frame. For every row, it will pick up age bin, which we calculated earlier. It will pick up marital status. Both are both these are strings, right? So I can just concatenate them, and I am applying that to this new variable. So someone had a question about map method, right? So apply I guess works on every row. So ind, I'm not selecting a single column now. I'm selecting this whole data frame, and I'm saying apply it to it along axis one, and then this will be worked up on every row. Any questions here? It's very simple. I'm just taking two columns which are already there in my data frame and I'm just creating a new column out of it. Right? And this is based on the exploratory analysis that we did earlier. I think you can do a transformation on every row. So axis zero will allow. So here we are taking one column and taking some other column and try to concatenate them or doing some operation. Rows, I think, will allow you to do something like lagged variables, calculating lag variables, and so on. So, access one means column. Yes. So, we are selecting columns here and doing some operation. So, if you think about it, I'm not doing it an explicit for loop here. I'm saying whatever I'm doing here, do it, do it for every row. I'm, I'm, I care only about specifying what I want to be done with the columns. All right. So. This is very simple. Uh, so this is just one example of feature engineering, right? We had a revelation in our exploratory stage. So why not go and create a new? Now, if you print uh, the unique counts, this is something that it looks like. So highest percentage is senior people uh, who are married, or the top age being. Uh, lowest is young and divorced. Uh, in a real world project, you might say that these are very small categories. I might as well eliminate those. Those are also outliers, but <coughs> it's it's more of a trial and error. Okay. What is access equal to? Yeah. So access equal to one. You you're doing an apply method on the data frame, right? Where there is one column and there is another column, and you want to concatenate them. So I'm specifying access one. The operation that I'm doing is related to access. I'm specifying my operation with respect to columns. If you have access equal to zero, you can specify operations on the rows. So probably offline we can uh, sync on this. So what can we do? Uh, so if you say access to one, so it's, uh, along that time it will apply on the, on the rows. If you specify zero or two, I don't know which one is the case. Okay. Then it will apply your function on all the columns. So you want to, for example, compute your uh, mean column wise. Then you can apply the mean function with access equal to zero or two, whichever is relevant to you. Can we do that? I'm not sure if this will work. I guess you'll have to define this some function which you want to apply along the rows. Yeah, so we can do analysis functions, right? Lambda, yes, you can define lambda here. So I think with lambda, if you do mean inside, just try that. So yeah, that's a good suggestion. So yeah, it doesn't know how to input the parameters. So we have to tell it specifically. Zero is for column and one is for column. Yes, zero is zero. Maybe you can choose a column. Okay, uh, I'll come to this probably offline. We can sync and find out more about this. But it at least applied it column wise because that's how the yes. uh, values are printed. <coughs> All right. So another uh, example. I just want to uh, highlight feature engineering because this is something that you would keep.
doing a lot of times in a real world project. So we had this variable called balance. Okay. Now, if you think about it, uh, having a higher bank balance at lower age could be a good sign, right? So he has a lot of money, and or he or she, and they might want to park that in a deposit scheme, right? This is a hypothesis worth trying. So what? And then second, this is again a disputable uh, way of transforming. What I'm saying is money is better off if you log that. So at the lower end of spectrum, whether I don't know, you earn $10,000 versus $20,000, it matters. But beyond a point, it doesn't matter. If you earn 20 crore or 25 crore, it's, your life stage might be the same, right? So this is just an example. Uh, don't uh, come to me uh, disputing that. So what I'm doing is, uh, so this is another example of how do you do feature transformations, right? So we said that higher balance at a lower age is a good sign. So what I can do is I can take my balance and divide by age and that will give me a better variable or that will give me a new variable which I can use in my model rather than using balance and age individually. So we imagine the higher the value of this, the better chances we have. Right. So 18 year old with that 100,000 in his bank balance, he'll probably fall for that scheme. Right. He has a lot of liquid money. About a 95 year old will say that, man, I just have this money with me. I, I don't want to in invest in your scam. Right. Uh, so, and the second was that balance, uh, I can take a log of balance, right? So what log does is smaller end, 10,000 versus 20,000 and higher end, which is say 10 lakh and 20 lakh, they will be brought to the same scale, right? So this is not strictly necessary. I just want to highlight that as a creative way of you can creating, you can keep on creating more and more features. So also because of compound interest, you expect your money to go exponentially with time, and age is time. So you want to either exponentiate the age or log the money. Right. So you, what you've done it makes sense. Yes. Right. So, uh, so what I'm doing here is, and the balance was negative by the way. Uh, so log is not defined for negative outcomes. So what I'm doing is I'm just adding a high value here. Our minimum was around 8,000. If you remember that, describe that we ran. So this will ensure that this balance is positive. Then taking a log of it, Dividing by age, right? Don't worry too much about it, but this is something that you should try, right? So sometimes coming up with such creative features uh, gives you a far better outcome than worrying about should you use neural network or logistic regression, right? <coughs> so this labels is just I am creating fancy names for my new variable. So I'll explain this, don't worry. Alright, so this is something that we did very similar to that marital status and age example. We created a transformation uh, and created the new variable called balance by age and bind that using our quantile curves. And then what I'm saying is my output, let me group it by this new feature or Eureka moment that I had and then tell me the uh, response rate, right? Now if you think about it, this is again a huge insight. Those with a high balance and lower age the response rate is again 7, 15% and whereas for the lower bin it is 8%, right? So this is almost double of the, your lowest pocket. If you start your marketing campaign just covering probably these two groups, that, that will give you the highest ROI. You can also find out how many people are there in each, each or each bin here, alright? That's a sizable number. So almost 20% of your data. How do you sort by the first column? I mean, if we if we had a sort order on it, how would you tell it to order by that? So how would we tell it to order by that? So basically, what is happening is uh, this quantile cuts, right? Uh, they are actually ordered variables. So when you run this order argument, so quantiles are order ordered, and I have given just these names on top of it. So I think. Oh, no. 
it is not ordered uh, by uh, ASCII string. Mm -hmm. ASCII. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Coding the mean. Is it ordered? No, even H is coming later. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'll find it. <laughs> Oh, very low is 14%. Yeah, that's what. Very low is actually low and medium. It's an extremely interesting insight. Yeah, that's a good insight again. Yeah. Right? So, uh, feature transformations are very useful. Right? They might throw up some very interesting insights. So, this is great. I, I missed this out. Very low is 14 percent, very high is 15 percent. Yeah. All right, uh, so it's 11 30. Do you want to take a five minutes break? Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. actually does probably make sense. It's probably all the older citizens in a citizen that we assume would not be investing. It seems that they probably do invest. Or they think of it as probably uh, a safe way to park their money, right? Yeah. Deposits are the least risky products out there. Yeah. So this probably also means that we should probably uh, find more fine tune that definition more to take care of that situation. Q cut that we uh, no that N P O that line itself. Okay. So I think we probably need to adjust that so that you have a nice shape there. Yeah. So I should. Uh, what is that N P O based on the assumption that the balance is very probably going to be in the middle No. So this is something that I'm saying it's a hypothesis. Right, so there is no science behind it. What I'm trying to say is, you might say that the um, difference between amount of money matters at the lower end of the spectrum more than the higher end of the spectrum. <coughs> right? So difference in the incomes of an Ambani versus an Adani doesn't matter. But for a common man, the difference would matter more. So if you take a log, it will scale it non-linear scaling. So that the lower differences and the higher differences are all, are all on the same scale. It's not at most necessary. In fact, you might want to eliminate that log and try to do the same exercise and see uh, what happens. I think that will take the insight away. I think log here makes a lot of sense. Right. So uh, five minutes break, five to ten minutes. Okay. So uh, basically, what we have covered is how do you get familiar with data? How do you do data transformations? And now we'll come to the actual modeling part. But so those who are worrying that hey, machine learning bola tha or half an hour, pehla 1.5 hours kuch liya nahi. This is very important, right? So these kind of uh, variables that we have created, those are far insightful and useful for your model, rather than you know just taking your data and feeding it into a logistic regression, right? So that is if you forget everything that you learned, please keep this insight with you. Yeah. So let's let's meet in five to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. I'll come. With you. All right, uh, so folks, uh, let's start with the actual MITI part. So I guess Bhargava has covered these things, right? Yesterday we talked about what is supervised learning, what is unsupervised. Uh, right now we are do dealing with a supervised learning problem. We know the outcomes, right? Uh, then there are these other varieties like semi-supervised and reinforcement. Uh, I wouldn't spend much time on this. But this is something uh, that I would want you to focus on for a couple of moments. Okay, uh, so when we uh, start with machine learning, all of us start with linear regression, logistic regression, right? The workhorses. So generally within machine learning or within analytics, typically there are these two cultures or two streams uh, through which these models were developed. Okay, the original one is the stats culture. Okay, uh, where we say <coughs> that there is some process happening in the nature which is generating my outcome and I want to model that process. Okay. Uh, for example, if you say logistic regression, what we say is there is this process which is generating binary outcomes and then there are these variables. Their value relates to the log of odds of my outcome and I want to model this whole function. And then in this community, uh, the focus is on the question, what is the model that you're using? Is that model a good fit? So if you uh, remember our uh, stats 101 classes, uh, we spent a lot of time on goodness of fit test and hypothesis testing. Even people who deal with uh, marketing sample samples, 
uh, or say polling and election related data uh, they they tend to work in this domain right regression models survival analysis which is very popular in insurance industry all this is a good part which comes from the stats culture but the important point is the focus is on why this model or what is the process that is generating the outcome and the basic theory is coming from the stats world on the other hand this ai or ml culture they take a different world view they say that i don't care what process is generating the outcome for me it's a black box and my focus is my focus is on getting good prediction so in fact those coming purely from an ml culture or those say who studied ml in their engineering or masters they would have never heard of hypothesis testing or goodness of fit there the focus is more on cross validations and these this is the typical jargon uh, from the ai world or the models like ensemble models i'll, co I'll cover those tree based model neural networks they all originated in uh, the ml community if you think about it we we need both uh, how many of you have done the coursera course on machine learning anyone here right so there is few of you right so they say that hey we are fitting this gradient descent for logistic regression and here is my cost function that's a good part but how does that cost function come from right so that cost function is nothing but a maximum likelihood estimation which is derived out of this theory so the point i am trying to stress is these two communities are often at odds with each other but for a practitioner you should try to take best of both worlds all right so uh so now we are going to fit a model and to this is like the last mile uh, before we actually go to the modeling part now we did create two of our own variables for life stage and this balance by age and what i'm doing is there are these other four variables which i think might affect the outcome or which we might say that whether a person is already having a loan on him does he default or does he own a house what is his education so let's try to fit a model using only these variables all right so i could go the other way and i could just throw in all the possible variables but that just makes it messy to analyze it and even in a real world project this might be a way that you follow so even if you have say 1000 variables in your data set you might want to start your first model by using only those columns which you actually understand and try to establish a baseline of accuracy and then maybe you keep on exploring the other columns right so that's like a practical tip so here uh, very simple but this part of the code looks slightly complicated for those who didn't come from the python background so i'll explain this and then you can copy paste so what i'm doing is i'm taking this original data frame and from that data frame i am only selecting these columns assigning it back to another data frame here right here instead of doing this you can use that dot ix part that we used earlier for column subsetting and i have this new data frame which are all my features that i am going to use uh, oh i'm sorry uh, there is some issue here all right so there are these two square brackets it should be only one right so this is just the names of the variables feature names should be a series which i mean this should be a array or whatever so i guess that's why the two yeah i'm i'm slightly doubtful about this so just try both this if you get an error just run with two or one okay so the point is i'm trying to only select few variables now here what i want to do is these variables are categorical right they take a finite number of values now the library sklearn or scikit that we want to use for fitting our models it wants every variable uh, it doesn't accept this uh, categorical variables so r by default supports factors right vargava mentioned that yesterday but here what we want to do is suppose if there is a variable which takes five values i want to instead create four binary variables out of it <coughs> right so housing takes two values yes and no instead i'll just have a new variable called yes which is a binary 10 column 
It will be 1 when housing is yes and it will be 0 otherwise. So I want to do that for every variable. So what I am doing here is, I have this list of feature names which should, shouldn't be, if you ask me these two uh, square bracket, should be just one and you don't need this IND. I just want the list of feature names, so this, forget this part. So I just need the names of my features. What I am doing is, I am taking one name at a time and from my data frame, I am selecting that column. I am saying whatever is the name of that variable, just prefix that to the column name and then give me dummies for that variable. So this get dummies is a function in pandas, what it will do is, suppose education takes three values, it will return you a data frame with three columns which are indicator variables for education. So why do you give an IF I'll, I'll explain that. So, so just a small clarification. So, in feature names, we want the name of all yes. the columns. So, this is a bug. So, so IND should not be there. IND should not be there. So, we just need the feature names. Right? So, forget this part and forget this part. Okay, we just, we, we want to subset our data frame with these features, but these features are categorical. Get term is what it will do is for every feature it will return me a data frame which is going to have multiple columns, right? Now if a if a feature takes n values, I am okay to have n minus one vectors or binary outcomes, right? Because the nth one is just if everyone else is zero then the n nth one is going to be one. So if if a variable takes n number of values, I can have n minus one columns indicator columns, right? So I hope this is clear, right? Uh, any issues, please point it out. So this part of code is just doing that in a fancy loop. It is iterating over each of these variables, selecting that from the data frame, then calling this get dummies method, which will return a data frame for that variable. And here we are saying, give me all rows, but start from the first column. So zeroth column of every uh, variable is getting eliminated. So that's how we are ensuring that the categorical variable to vectors or binary vectors transformation, we are eliminating one column. We are just taking n minus one. If there are n values in that outcome, so this this whole piece, uh, if you have some doubts, uh, we can talk about it after the workshop, right? And then for each one, I'll keep on creating a data frame, which is there. So this DF list will actually give me a list of data frames for each variable, and I'm just then concatenating everything together. So. Sounds like fancy, but uh, it's very simple once you understand the concept. And sorry for this bug. So, just let me know once you're done with copying or. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, what I'm going to do is. I'm saying feature names. Feature names is just a list of names. I'm creating another list. Okay, so if you do a length function on this new list, it has six data frames inside it. So we selected these six variables. So DF list is a list of those because if you check the type of the first entry of that list, it's a data frame. So instead we have a list of data frames here for each variable and I just want to now uh, concatenate everything together. And the columns of that data frame correspond to the values that that variable can take? Yes, n minus 1. So if the variable, original variable is taking n values, mm -hmm. 
you will have n minus one column in the resulting data set. Please go to check. Yes, I think so. So after concatenation, we'll have the complete data frame ready. So even the first DF test is having the columns. Right. So. Right. So why is that? Because if we take the first variable, which is live stage, and run a value count on this. Let's just say unique. We had around 12 here, uh, right? So now that live stage was put into the first list, first element of that container, mm -hmm. which is a data frame with 11 columns. So one for everyone, it created one binary indicator vector and okay. removed one of it. Okay. All right. So, and then this command concatenation, I'm just concatenating them together. <coughs> Right, so that gives us a final feature matrix. All right, so we had this 44,000 because we eliminated those wealthy folks, and now we have 21 features. So we are going to build a classification model using 21 features. The other part is we need a target variable. So this we will pick up the dummy y that we created directly. There is another point that we need to be aware of here. If you take a look at the type of this, it's a series. All right. So it's a single column that we picked out of our data frame. So it's a series. So now we are set. We have a something that we want to predict, and we have a feature matrix. All right. So what is the model that we are going to fit? So a lot of courses start or cover regression, so I wanted to take a slightly different path, we will we'll focus on random forest. So did Bhargava cover random forest yesterday? Yes. 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 All right. So, good revision. Uh, so I will spend some time on random forest. So random forest originated in decision tree model. All right. So this is the ML or the AI community's way, where we say that, oh, I don't care the process which generates the outcome, just tell me what is the data looks like. So it says that, Hey, this is a hypothetical example and it tries to say that which is the variable which is achieving the maximum split. If I take my original data frame or data and if I divide by say this variable being yes or no and then this and then this and then at each leaf node what is my response rate or the outcome that I am trying to predict. That is what a decision tree does. All right, so it given the data and a bunch of variables, it fits uh, this kind of model. It says that, and the point is these are very intuitive to understand, right? If you give someone a logistic regression, you'll have to spend the day explaining what are log of odds and stuff. So decision trees, in fact, I, I feel that these are very good first models because they are very intuitive. It says that, hey, those with income greater than 60,000 and they have saved more than 10%, they are more likely to operate. Probably this is an example from cards or credit card industry. <coughs> All right. So focus on predictions. I don't care how the nature is generating the outcome. Uh, at each stage, you keep on saying which is the variable which achieves maximum separation, and I keep on building my uh, decision tree. Uh, so one problem that decision trees always have is called as overfitting. All right. So what happens is at every node you keep on finding the next variable which is splitting your data such that the individual child children of that node have a difference in their conversion rate or response rate. It keeps on splitting your data but when you keep on going to lower and lower depth the number of data points in each node is going to keep on going down. Right? So you might reach a stage where at some node you just had two data points or two customers and you split them and you call it as an insight, right? And that is overfitting. So a pattern that you have observed only in two customers <coughs> or five customers, you are saying that's a good pattern, and you are trying to generalize that. That is overfitting. So I'll I'll spend more time on overfitting later. So this is so decision trees are good. They are intuitive, uh, simple to fit, easy to explain, but they have this problem of overfitting. So that's where uh, random forest came into picture. So what uh, random forest does is, instead of 
fitting a single tree, I'll fit multiple trees. But if I am fitting with the same number of variables and same data, it will be the same tree. I need to induce some kind of randomness. Okay, so what they do is they create random samples of your original data. <coughs> so if I have say data of 100,000 observations, I can specify uh, that I want to build 10 trees and it will pick up some random sample of that data and on that random sample it will start building a decision tree. That is inducing randomness at the observation level. right? So each of that data frame may not contain all the observations. And second level of a randomness that they induce is wherever you are doing a search for the next variable which gives you a split, they don't allow you that search on all the features. What they say is that if I have 20 variables or 20 features in my data, I'll only allow you to search on 10. Okay, so now why is this useful? So uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, you want, you ask a question to your friend that, hey, do you think I'll like the movie Titanic? And he is supposed to answer that using a machine learning model. Okay. And what you give him is you give him a past data of other people that hey people liking movie X also like movie Y. Now if your friend fits a decision tree then what might happen is he might give a lot of importance to some variable. right? So your friend might say there are only two categories of people those who like action movies and those who don't like and those who don't like action movies they like romantic movies so you will like Titanic. <coughs> Right? So decision tree is that in random forest what you are doing is you are asking the same question to multiple people but they are not allowed to ask you same set of questions. Right? That is in plain English explanation of what is random forest doing. So I guess on Quora there are a lot of these threads which explain random forest in detail. It's a fantastic algorithm. Very very useful. Okay, So we are going to fit a random forest on our data set. Subset is also randomly. Yes. Uh, the variable subsetting? subset of features. Yes, yes, yes. It is picked randomly. So, Harshal, in yes. decision tree, the split is made based on the information entropy of the. Yes. Right. So, in the random forest that does not come to Yes. Features, it's they still use the information. Yes. But on what basis they decide which, which features to use? Entropy and information. Yeah. Only entropy. Yes. yes. So, what only thing that you are doing is in a decision tree, you would always have 20 features to start with. Now if I fit two different decision trees with the same set of features, I am going to end up with the same decision tree. What I will do is I will fit two different decision trees but at each level I will pick say 10 features at random from the 20 available. Randomly. Randomly. And I will fit a decision tree. Randomly and not used already in an earlier step? I think that you can specify. Okay. It's It's allowed to use the same so now the result is that th there. So this is how you uh, force the algorithm to take a look at all possible variables and not just go for the greedy outcome mm -hmm. of selecting say top two or three. So it's more of a probabilistic model. Where <coughs> multiple <coughs> models probabilistic. I think ideally you should uh, you should refill the array. Like ideally you should like uh, you take ten. Yes. Samples, you put it's a sample you with replacement. Mm -hmm. with replacement. Yes. 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 So just stepping back one, uh, where we created that feature matrix. Yes. Uh, so the only reason that he created that is because uh, the method or the model that we're going to use does not accept category. Yes. yes. Is that true for every model that we typically use? No, it's true for Escalon, the library that we are using. I think R will automatically understand that this is a feature, a categorical variable. Because yesterday we did something similar in R. Yeah, but I think R supports factor variables by default. Alright, so here is the code. This is how it looks like. So Escalon, now we have this new library, which is the standard machine learning package for Python. Right. So everyone doing machine learning in Python, they typically end up using scikit-learn. So these are called ensemble models, right? Because I'm not fitting one tree, I have this forest of trees, and then everyone is going to give me a prediction and I'll just I'll average out 
and give my final prediction that is <coughs> one symbol. So I'm importing that particular class. I'm instantiating this object of this particular class with a random state because these are randomized models. So if I learn this again, I would want the same set of random numbers coming up. Right, so initial part of yesterday's talk, mm -hmm. this is what we did. Why 42? Those who have read Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy. <laughs> uh, right, so then we had this feature matrix and then we had this target, which is a series. So from that I am extracting values. These target dot values is going to be 1 and 0. So I am saying, hey, this object fit a model of this class on these features and this outcome. Okay. Now why, uh, so random forests are good because they allow you to print something called as feature importance. If you, we had around 20 features in this feature matrix, what is, so this, forget this part, it, it tells you the importance of each feature in your uh, model and then you can also score this. Okay, so I am going to run this, uh, don't worry if you are not able to cover up this part. It's more of an understanding here. So just remember this part, right? So you instantiate an object and you fit your model. All right, so it has fit a model. So this model object is a class and it has this So by the way one dip, this DIR model prints a lot of information about the object of that class uh, So if you uh, look at, take a look at this uh, it has this bunch of information about the number of estimators used. We'll come to the will come to cover this. The random state that we had set, and there is a score method. Uh, there is this method for predicting outcomes on newer data set, and and, and a bunch of others. I'm trying to find this. It is two underscores between feature and importances. Thanks. So basically the 21 variables that we were using, what it has done is, uh, it has printed the importance of each variable. So I'll, I'll try to print this in a better way. So I'm just converting that to better readable percentages, don't worry about it. You can use this code later. Okay, so what it says is, <coughs> if I have 100 important in total, whether the person is already having a loan on him has 11 percent important, all right? Whether he is defaulting slightly of a lesser value, education comes out, so tertiary education comes out to be significant and then there are these life stages that we created, right? Even they, they are good, right? 6 percent here and then there are these bunch of others. Right? Even the balance, very high, comes out to be around 5% and stuff like this. So basically if you are presenting this as a result to a business user who doesn't understand machine learning, random forests are very good, <coughs> right? Because it gives you a nice, uh, what you can say, nice explanation about how the features are contributing to your output. Okay, so we have fit a model now. Do you want me to wait or move on? I'll move on. I'll take that as moving on. So, and now I need to. So, we said that evaluating a model is very important. Okay. So, I'll cover a simple evaluation called a score. Okay. So, the model object that we fit. It says that hey, it's out of hundred, it has a score of eighty-eight percent. Right, but there is something very, very ingenuine that we've done here. Can someone point it out, please? Yeah, uh, I mean, they're giving the same. There's no test 
Exactly. All right. So what is happening is I fit a model on my feature matrix and target values, and I'm trying to score the model on same. This is not this is not useful at all. So that come, there comes the theory of evaluation. So evaluation of models is very very important. Okay, you need to have generally a single metric that you are looking at when you are evaluating model that helps you to compare models right and that helps you to keep a track of your progress so we have we have spent what around 2 hours if you are working on a real project for say number of days you need to keep a track of where you are moving right so a single right metric for evaluating your models is very important so metrics for <coughs> and the metric depends on what kind of model you are fitting for regression model you are predicting a real value right so the metrics that are used there are something like mean squared error or mean absolute percentage error right those are the metrics which are used in regression model on the other hand when we are dealing with classification model we are outputting binary outcomes we predict probabilities of success spread probability of respondents and if that probability <coughs> is greater than a threshold we say outcome is 1 otherwise we say outcome is 0 how do you evaluate those models so uh, focus on this diagram all right so some of you may know this already we have a prediction outcome and then we have the actual so these are the people who actually subscribe to that uh, deposit scheme and these are the ones which we predicted that they will subscribe so these are true positives <coughs> some of them are actually positives but we couldn't predict them we said these are bad so these are false negatives we should have predicted predicted them to be positives but we have done the other way around and then there are the other uh, things here so we calculate two metrics on this one is called as precision so what we do here is you take your true positives and you divide it by the total number which you predicted to be positive all right so hold on to that thought for a moment what are you doing precision says the ones that you are predicting to be positive how many of them are actually positive <coughs> if if that number is very small your model has got it completely wrong on the other hand there is this another metric which is summing around this row it says the ones which were actually positive how many are covered by your model Right. If this number is small, then even that is bad. In that bank marketing campaign, there were 5,000 <coughs> respondents. But if my model is covering only say 1 or 2 percent of it or 10 percent of it, what do you mean by covering it? Uh, okay, I'll explain that. When you fit a model and you do a prediction, so we had that original data. What you can do is you can split that data. I'll, I'll cover that part. You can split that data in two parts. Fit your model on this train set. And on test set, you do a prediction. That prediction is going to be a probability. Based on that probability, you decide a threshold that if that probability is greater than 0.5, I'll call my outcome or my prediction as positive. Those will be here, and the others will be here. So now, what I'm saying on recall is, if the ones that you are predicted to be positive form a very small subset of the actual positives, actual respondents even in that test set, then your model is bad. And in fact, these two metrics are sometimes are at odds with each other. And you need a model which is balanced on each of them. right? So we'll cover to that part now. So this is very important. Classification models, you would be fitting them every time in your work. And how do you evaluate classification models is good. Because uh, if you think about this score matrix, right? I don't even know what that library is printing as a score. Right? So I can't be just satisfied that hey, 88 percent. So uh, scikit learn it allows a slightly better way of uh, evaluating a classification model. So this, even if you don't copy paste this, it's okay. This is going to be covered again after a couple of slides. I'll just print this result for everyone to see. Alright, 
So this is what our model that we've just fit is doing. Can you see something here? Zero. Uh, so what it has done is, the original number of respondents, the 5,000 respondents that were there, our model is not at all capturing any one of them. So in fact, this is a rounded result. The actual is around 0.03%. Our model is doing very, very bad at this stage. And there is this important, right? As a business owner, I'm interested in these numbers, right? Are you predicting respondents well? If you're building this model for detecting cancer, look at the catastrophe that it can cause, right? If you use this model directly. So even though this, this metric, F score, what it does is it takes a, I'll, I'll explain the formula. It basically takes a product, product of this and divides it by the sum. So basically what we are trying to say is that I want a model which is good on both. So is it also telling that the model is good for the negative, so zero is still Yes. Percent, right? okay. But not but useful. That's not useful. The, that's not, that's useful. not useful. But I mean that could also be because of the bias. There are many yes. more samples. In the exactly. Very important point. Because to start with we had only 5000 respondents. So if we blindly fit a model, Yeah. The model is going to be biased towards the class 0. Alright? So how do we? So F score is this. Precision into recall. Multiply that by twice and divide by P plus R. Uh, F score generally is a very good matrix for evaluating classification models. So if we take a look at, so predictions is the thing that our model is predicting. If I sum this, it will be a very small number, 22. All right, so our model is predicting that only 22 people would ever be interested in your scheme. And even out of those 22 that we predicted, hardly 12 or 13 turned out to be the real respondents. So even on precision, you're doing very bad. So, Okay, another problem that you might face in a real world project. Uh, so I spoke about overfitting a couple of slides back. Okay, so there are these two points. One is called bias, the other is called variance. When we are fitting a model, what we are doing is we have a data and we have some tunable parameters and we are trying to fit a function. Now what is going to happen is if I have a lot of levers to tune, I can always come up with a function which fits very well to the data. All right, or should I explain it again? Basically, we are trying to fit a function to a data and you have a lot of degrees of freedom. And so you can expect that a model will always fit very well on your training data. On the other hand, there are some models which perform very poorly even on training data, just like we observed in last slide. Our model is doing bad even on the training data. So if your model is not working well even on training data, that is called bias. Your model is way away or way outside uh, the actual range. On the other hand, what happens is the model fits very well on training data, but the moment you test it on some other data set, your predictions are way off. That is called the variance issue. And typically in every machine learning project, you would need to understand after your first or two, one or two iterations, which way are you going? The key idea is you need to always test it on a data set where there is no degree of freedom. You've already fit a model and then test it on a new data set where you're not touching anything in that model. You're just using it as a prediction service and then test your outcome. Right? That is the unbiased way of evaluating your model. So uh, I'll not spend too much time on this. Uh, the Coursera course by Andrew NG on machine learning, it has a fantastic coverage of bias and variance. He plots a lot of graphs and explains this problem very, very well. Because this is a problem you are likely to encounter a lot of times in your real world project. So uh, do spend some time uh, understanding that. Uh, couple of minutes on this. In classical regression models, we are trying to fit coefficients of that function. You have a function like y is equal to mx plus c. You are trying to find out m. In classical regression models, the problem of variance and bias is treated by saying that 
the value that the coefficient can take is restricted while fitting so don't worry if this theory is going a bit bouncer you don't have to know it but for those folks who are interested <coughs> classical regression models are nothing but optimization routines non linear optimization <coughs> routines what they do is they add a penalty which is proportional to the coefficients of the model that you are trying to fit and that's how they ensure that bias variance is taken care of random forest because it is inherently doing something in parallel and not selecting the same set of features at every node it is expected to remove variance because you are looking at the same data from different angles by selecting different features right so random forests are very popular because they are inherently good at handling variance another thing so we spoke about bias versus variance and then he mentioned a good point your data to start with can be very biased and the outcome that you are predicting depending on your application domain uh, your precision and recall can be very important right so what happens if in a marketing campaign you predict lot of people to be respondents even if they are not the costs are not very high right you would end up just annoying few people and that most of the banks and other marketing firms do it anyway right so they wouldn't care so bargava mentioned this example predicting pregnancy right yesterday by done by some company what if you get that wrong right if your probability thresholds you you might cause divorce and i don't know there are, there will be some huge implications and then a catastrophic think of it someone tells you that hey uh, can you fit a model which predicts whether pakistan is going to launch a nuclear strike and based on the outcome of that model we should launch a preemptive strike <laughs> right and and then you say that oh i fit the model correctly but i didn't care about the precision and recall uh, right and my model is very bad on predicting ones actually uh, <laughs> you can't go wrong there once you have the declared that is no way money it does going to be a preemptive strike so it will always be right no no i'm saying that pakistan hasn't launched it and what if your model gets it wrong and you launch it from your side so after that you have no way of figuring out if there will be right right so the point i'm trying to stress is model evaluation precision recall are very important right don't ignore them even if your library is telling you that the model has 80% score go to the classification report and think of it how does the cost outweigh right the thing that you are predicting if you get it wrong what will be the cost so for example in this thing predicting someone to be one when he is a zero he or she is a zero the costs are not that high but here or here uh, you you need to be careful okay so now we do an iteration based on all these ideas that we learned what i'm doing i'm saying that this feature matrix and the target now split them into training and test set okay so this this little functions here they help us to split that so from these two training and test sets we get four data set the training set of features test set of features training set of target and test set of targets and you can specify the size of the split it could be 70 30 it could be 60 40 then here is another important part because our data is imbalanced towards zeros we need to artificially inflate or give importance to the ones there are multiple ways of doing that what you can do is you can random sample your data such that both classes are represented equally or the other way to do it is you can tell the model that if something is one i want to put a very high importance on that as compared to the ones which are zero is there a typo here this should be yes. else y. one yeah. so when y is one it should be nine and when y is zero my weight is one so what i'm doing is i'm doing it exactly opposite to the uh, response rate that we have in the data set in my data in our data set y0 is 90% and y1 is about 10% i am doing it exactly reverse you can get fancy around this you can uh, actually form a loop and keep on trying out different weights and see which one fits right so there are all these possibilities so here we have taken care of so here we have taken care of not testing our model on the same data set here we take care of imbalance here what we are doing is 
we are telling the random forest classifier that the minimum number of data points that you should have in a node to split that is 10 and the minimum number of samples or number of data points that you that go in a leaf is also 10 so anything that you say is a pattern has to be true for at least 10 customers right in fact this number should be higher i'm i'm just taking a reasonably large number here that any questions on that that is to avoid overfitting yes right so that will say that hey if you are saying that balance greater than 50 definitely signals a respondent that condition has to be true for at least 10 respondents or 10 customers otherwise it's not an insight would help in pruning the tree yes in fact you can specify the maximum depth of the tree also okay. you can say that maximum that you can go is 4 so there are lots of lots of parameters you can read the documentation but these are some ways of ensuring that you are not just looking at some random noise in the data you are actually searching for patterns and then I'll fit this model and then run the thing again so I'll just copy paste this part Now we have slightly different results if you see because we artificially boosted the weightage for class 1 our model is doing well on the recall side now so fix the weight no no there, there was no type of weight. here we are saying if y is 1 weight is 9 otherwise weight is 1 so the n jobs minus 1 actually makes it parallel yes so those who care if you have multiple cores in your machine you set that to minus one mm -hmm. it will automatically detect the number of cores and spawn multiple jobs all right so and the good part here now if you think about it training and test data sets the results are very similar when you have a variance problem these two numbers will be very different that's a sign of identifying variance or overfitting so we don't have a overfitting problem we have a bias problem so we are doing good on recall but on precision it's very poor the ones we are predicting to be one only 18 percent of them turn out to be respondents but we are covering almost 70 percent of the respondents could you repeat that what is the relation between uh, precision recall bias and variance? okay precision is if you predict someone to be a respondent what percentage of them actually turn out to be respondents that number is very small in our case all right recall says out of all respondents how many are covered by your prediction equal to one so 70 percent of the respondents are getting covered that's good part okay and bias and variance this is the score on my original training data set okay what i'm saying is give me a classification report where true value is from training and prediction value is from predicting on the training part and here I am saying take my test feature data set predict on that and compare that against test target values now if this final scores if they are very different and this one is higher and this one is way lower then that indicates that your model is fitting to the training data set very well but it is actually fitting to noise in the data that's why whenever it sees a new outcome it has no clue what to do this doesn't seem to be a problem in this case but the problem is now here so now what we'll have to keep doing is basically we had two three parameters to tune right you can get fancy you can form arrays of these parameters and then keep on looping keep on taking these values and then come up with a nice model right that does everything well the no. so if you uh, right so that's a very good question this point right uh, so let me just go back to slides in fact okay so basically our inference is we are slightly better but poor on precision what are the next action that we can take so we one that we can do is we can change the probability threshold right so our, our model is predicting probabilities this code here predict there is another method called predict proba 
probability which predicts the actual numbers this directly gives the labels with 0.5 as the default threshold instead you can say that i want my threshold to be 0.6 or 0.7 right that is one way you can tune your model because right now what is happening is we are uh predicting too many people to be respondents right so if you increase your prob probability threshold you might correct that is there a way to find the probability yes it's called as roc curve Re receiver operating characteristic curve so that is what you should plot in the real world but i'm not covering that part here right so that is one lever that you can keep tuning the other lever is there were these bunch of parameters like weights you can ch change those weights and then there were parameters in the tree right so the point is library is not going to help you it was going to just do what you say and then give you the results these are manual things that you have to invariably carry out in every real world project right and then actually understand what are the outcomes and keep on iterating what might happen is despite doing these two actions we always end up in the same vicinity so this this is what it was looking like despite trying different weights and different parameters for the tree you might end up in the same vicinity then that is a sign that you don't have enough features or you don't have enough predictive features we built this model with what six features from the original if we try with more features or go back to your data team go back to your sql databases pull in more information what could i know more about this customer all right so biased uh biased models you need to add more features very <coughs> variance problem you need to prune your trees you need to ensure that you are not uh, fitting your models to noise in the data right so this is a very important tip okay how much time do we have we have half an hour so as promise Uh, let's move on from unsupervised unsuper learning to unsupervised learning. Okay, in unsupervised learning, we do not have a label for a data set. In last exercise, we we were we were knowing that these people responded, these did not respond. Unsupervised learning is more about finding structure. I have these data points. Can you tell me something about it? Applications are used, so uh, don't underestimate unsupervised learning. Customer segmentation. for marketing uh, a very standard activity you have customers you segment them into chunks and then you try to map different offers to everyone topic based classification of documents all right a very uh, text mining kind of uh, application mm -hmm. or you have a huge data set of say 1000 columns you want to reduce the dimensionality so unsupervised learning is pervasive in all these applications all right so we are going to fit something called as k means clustering those who are feeling sleepy i'll urge you to at least do this exercise right one more model uh so what it does is you represent your customers as data points in a cartesian space where each column is a feature so this could be age this could be balance so each customer is a data point in that space to start with what you do is you randomly initialize some points as your clusters so if i say that i want to fit three clusters in my data set i'll randomly initialize some points and for every point i'll check which one is the nearest so if i initialize my center somewhere here for this data point i can find out the distance from each center and this being the nearest one i'll say that this guy belongs to this cluster okay that is one iteration after i do the assignments i will recalculate the centroid of all customers all data points which are in the same cluster <coughs> right that will shift my centroids yes you had a question no, no. So yeah how do you start the first so you randomly initialize that so you know a range of every variable uh, you start randomly in fact you can spawn jobs in parallel with a different initialization <coughs> everywhere all right so you start with randomly initializing or if you have some clue about your application domain you can use that you intuitively feel that the clusters are going to be in this region then you can start with that and then you keep on iterating this process you reassign people or you reassign data points calculate the centroid again 
till you hit a convergence where no more there are changes. Everybody is fit, fit into a cluster, right? So that is how, in plain English, K-means algorithm works. All right, code. So, and the more most important part is if you think about it, uh, your variables need to be on the same scale for doing this, because you we are calculating Euclidean distance here. Right? If your variables are on a different scale, uh, your results are going to be haywire. You need to ensure that they are all on the same scale and you need not only use Euclidean distance, there are other fancy distance calculation methods. So I won't go into all those details. But the important point is what we do is from the data set, we select these two variables, convert them into a matrix. This is so that uh, we can fit our cluster on that. And here I am scaling them, mean uh, and variance normalization. I guess Bhargava covered that. So from every data point, subtract the mean and divide by the variance of that. You scale them. This is very important. Number of clusters, there is no very simple way to decide number of clusters. It is driven by the outcome that you observe. So basically, it's an iterative process. It's a huge research topic. and uh, somewhat some knowledge of your application or the problem that you're trying to solve. So here uh, I'm taking things like age and balance. You might say that uh, two or there are typically two or three, uh, what you can say, bins of people. You initialize your class object with this default. You fit your data, predict the labels, that is predict the cluster label for each data point, And here I'm plotting them. Alright, so I'll directly copy paste this because we are slightly short on time. Because understanding the result here is more important. Oops. All right. So what we did is we took our age variable and we took our balance variable, we scaled them and we said that, hey, do some iterations and tell me three distinct groups in my data set. And what it has done, if you observe is, so there are these ones, I don't know if that blue color is visible. So there are these ones in blue here, there are some in red, and then there are these three in green. All right, so it is just, so I took only two variables here because it is very easy to visualize. You can put more variables <coughs> inside. But the important part is to remember that these are numeric variables, right? If one is numeric and the other is binary, it can be slightly troublesome because the variances are completely different on a real and a binary vector. And secondly, you need to scale them. And you can get fancy about how do you calculate distance, etc., etc. So k-means, clear? Basically, you don't have a label for your data set. You are trying to find out if there are different chunks in your customer data set. Unsupervised learning. All right, so number of deciding number of clusters, uh, not a very easy problem or not a solved problem. <coughs> Scaling is important. Okay, so uh, it's almost 12.30. So we are done with the hands-on part. A uh, couple of tips, I'm going to be putting this on the JIT repo. So those who missed out or couldn't follow copy pasting that code, you can please, please do it after you go home, right? It's a good good experience. In fact, get creative. We we dealt with some only five or six variables in that supervised learning exercise. Try out with the other variables, right? Uh, now I'll, I'll spend say around 15 minutes on talking about unstructured data. This is another problem that you would want to uh, understand. So take these examples. The examples that we focused on so far, they've been very nice, right? You had a nice curated uh, data given to you. But what if you're dealing with uh, things like face recognition or spam filtering, news article recommendation, product recommendation, or detecting motion in videos for security <coughs> reasons, 
right? These are examples of unstructured data, or to put it in better words, where the model of the data as a two-dimensional table is not very evident from the data itself. So the problem is the pre-processing this data is harder. In our case, we were just dealing with strings and numbers. If you start dealing with images, you would want to understand uh, is it stored in a JPEG or a PNG and what those values means, is it RGB and blah blah blah. Right? So you would want, you would need a more details about the application domain, so pre-processing becomes harder and coming up with a data model is not easy. What is happening here is this, right? so if you again forget everything from this workshop, please remember this slide. Machine learning works when you have a Cartesian coordinate or a vector space representation of your data. Right? When you are fitting, we fit that cluster model, we had bunch of points in that space and we created clusters. When we create classifiers, we are trying to find a hyperplane which divides my positive outcomes and negative outcomes. So each customer is a data point, some of them are here which are plus ones, some of them are here which are zeros and find probably a hyperplane which divides them. <coughs> so once you can bring your data to this representation, then life is easy. Right? But in case of unstructured data, how do you even come up with this model? That is the challenge. Uh, I'll give some examples. If you're doing text and document mining, I seem to be working a lot with this problem. You just have emails or data grab from HTML pages, customer reviews, tweets, posts on your page of your social network. This is all text data. How do you do any classification or clustering on top of that? The insight is words form your access. Remember this. If you have a document, words form your axis and then each document is just a data point in that space. And there, the creative part would be which words to keep in your model. If you have things like and the, the typical English talk words, they are not telling you much about the document. So how do you transfer your document to this representation? There is the creativity. Yes, each word then becomes a column in your data frame. Data frame and, and then there is a one zero. Yes. And then you have to get creative about eliminating stop words. Whether you want to convert everything to a lower case. Uh, how do you deal with multiple spaces? You need to trim those. And in fact, it's good. Uh, life is good as long as we are in English. If you move on to Chinese. Yes. Yeah, Chinese. Like yes. <laughs> you can't do tokenization. They don't have, I guess, concept of space separating words. What are you doing that? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, uh, Shailesh sir, uh, who is going to take the last workshop. He's going to talk about Chinese. Last time, no, he he didn't talk about Chinese, but he had worked on text mining and he had a nice presentation last time. I'm hoping that this time he gives some insights on maybe text maybe mining. We should tell them, you know, start. Uh, are you working with Chinese domain? Yeah, 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 I'm not sure. So, um, but another thing, do we have a repository for all the stop words that I can use rather than the NLTK? NLTK, yes. Yeah. Huh? So NLTK Python? So NLTK has a repository with all yeah. English, English. Yeah. And I guess for Russian and other, yeah. Yeah. there would be some. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Right? So I'll move on. Text. Words are access, documents are data points. Text can be anything, these are not only books, these could be tweets, these could be posts on social network, but there in fact the problems are even harder. People use slang language, so stop words don't work out, probably, <coughs> right? So there are a bunch of problems associated with that domain, but they don't, they have a little to do with machine learning, More, it, it's more about understanding the problem. Uh, image data, not very evident, but probably the axis could be the pixels. Alright, so each pixel will have some intensity value between 0 to 255 depending on the uh, the JPEG or the compression algorithm used and then each image is some some data point in that space is, is the crude way I can think about it. Video data, that's even harder, right? You go into Einstein's four dimensional space because time comes into picture. Alright, so the point being is vector space 
representation this you you need to aim to come to this whatever is your application domain if you have this unstructured unlabeled crude data you need to somehow bring that data to here and then the libraries can take over okay uh, last part some real world tips these are very important so first is avoiding gigo approach so some of you might have thought that hey first one hour we were just looking at individual variables uh, he didn't mention machine learning all right so garbage in and garbage out there is always this urgency that i have this data let me just feed into a library run 10 different algorithms oh let me use neural networks that's what the world seems to be using why not deep learning all right all the buzzwords avoid that if you don't understand what your features are representing if you don't understand how your outcome variable is distributed there is no use fitting that data right it can be catastrophic depending on the application domain importance of data and feature data model and feature engineering we touched on these aspects the age bending the balance ratio that we uh, calculated right those are important steps in fact in my experience in most of the practical real uh, world machine learning problems feature engineering is going to be the differentiator rather than whether you use an svm or a neural network you can find that whatever fancy algorithm that you use most of the outcome or the most of the accuracy scores will be in the same vicinity ballpark but if you can come up with better features to represent your problem that will give you actually a step function of going to the next accuracy level all right a uh, fallacy of anti causal system this is a very important uh, if you read so this bank marketing data set you can find the original paper where they discuss their approach all right and what they have done is they have variables like <coughs> the duration of call as a feature in their model or previous outcome as a feature in their model so i this customer i contacted him earlier and this was the outcome can i use that as a feature up to some extent yes but beyond the point what you doing is future outcomes you are actually using that in your current model so duration of the call you are not going to see duration of the call unless you call that customer and the whole point of the exercise was which customer should you call right so anti causal systems are systems which depend on future right because what happens is the data that we store is often it will be the case that we are looking at a chunk of data from the month of july and we do have data from august all right and by mistake if we actually calculate or create a variable which depends on that future data then you are always going to get a 99% accurate model right so be aware of this trap future variables which depend on the future shouldn't be part of your model uh, to give uh, i'll i'll try to come up with better examples of this but this i did not get clearly like if the guy talks for 10 minutes maybe that person is really interested in what you're talking about yes but i would find that out only after i call him okay but when you do prediction on a newer data set you haven't called that person yet like you need to predict over time for 10 minutes right so that is the fallacy of anti causal system you can create a model because on historical data you would always know the duration of your call but on your future outcomes you don't know that so that cannot be a feature in your machine learning model right so what so did they decide in their paper about the duration of call so in fact they did mention that duration of the call although it future. comes out to be important but it is future but in fact uh, if you read their paper most of the variables that they come up with they are related to the previous outcome and i find that slightly uncomfortable because their point is first do a carpet bombing and for most of the customers you know the previous outcome and then you decide your next strategy yes that is useful but that is not machine learning because if i called up a customer and then he then he said that okay next saturday let's have another call i want to know more about this yeah, offer it, of yours yeah, it already shows that he is interested yes so there you you need not use a fancy model right so in fact what we have done within this 3 hours is much better we have taken demographic variables we have taken socio economic balance related variables right they they in fact don't mention those variable at all in their paper so that's good read up that paper so you will be able to connect lot of these dots about our approach that we have done all right so this is very similar to gigo approach that i was talking 
there are uh, a lot of these systems or APIs uh, that have spawned up these days which say that, hey, don't worry about what is the model. I have this nice API, take this API key, send me your data and I'll give you a prediction. Right? That's very bad. Because the point is, it looks very easy to use. I don't have to think about precision. I don't have to think about recall. There is this some big brother company which is doing all that work for me. But in my personal opinion, unless you understand what you are trying to model, unless you understand the features, uh, using black box models is is not good, right? Spend, do the hard work, even if it is slightly boring, uh, try to automate it, because we did a very manual approach of uh, looking at the distributions of variable, you can automate all that. But it's important to go through all these hooks and nooks, find out outliers, whatever we are cover we have covered today, right? Very, very important. If, if there is something which is promising you that you can skip all those phases and I'll give you a great model, uh, meet me out uh, after this lecture. Right, I have a nice scheme about investment in Africa that I want to tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, and the last part. All right, big data tools versus insights. Uh, we often tend to get conf get confused or get our priorities wrong in this. Whether we use R, so that was the reason I decided to use Python. In fact, I am personally not very very good at Python. I've been using R for a long time. But the point being, these are just means to get to the end. These are just means to get to a good model. And as long as the tool or library that you're using is able to print a faithful uh, representation, faithful result, as long as the, mo the method of fitting that regression itself is not wrong, you are okay to use any, any other tool, any tool, right? You can use Python, you can use R, if you are getting fancy, you can use Apache Spark. It doesn't matter. All right. It's Im it's important that are you able to bring out some insights from the data that are really useful and that are readily useful, right? So never spend your time worrying about should I use R or Python. Just see what is useful, what is having the least impedance mismatch with your own brain, and get on with it. Okay. So recap. So we covered objective a little bit because we had a curated data the objective was very clear get data i have not covered this uh, hope i am hoping to cover some part in my conference talk tomorrow do attend that exploration we spent a lot of time looking at the distribution looking at the outliers model we we have learned how random forest work what is bias what is variance what is precision what is recall why are they important how do you evaluate that model how do you overcome problems like overfitting? All right, and we, we did an iteration, right? We fit an initial model with no uh, weight and bias uh, introduced into that. Then we went back and created another better model. So that is iteration. Validation uh, on an out of sample data, probably we couldn't cover this, but that is more important. So basically, what that means is you put your model in production, start using it, and then keep on monitoring its performance. If you built your model originally with an F score of 0.8 and three months down the line, if your F score has gone down to say 0 0.6, that means the world has changed or probably some features that you included in your model are no more true in the outer world. All right. Ah, any questions? Uh, uh, so a shameless plug, we are hiring a data scientist at Socrates. So if you are feeling adventurous, drop me a line. Uh, yeah. So I'm open to questions if you have any. Can you uh, tell a bit about the work you do, like this, you said the click stream data you right, better right, right. So, so we are an advertising company, uh, we advertise on behalf of our clients on Google and Facebook and other channels and whenever someone is browsing or someone clicks on an ad, because of this intrusive tracking systems, we keep on getting lot of anonymized data about this cookie ID has clicked on this advertisement at this point of time and then he or she went on to browse this page on this e-commerce site and then ended up buying that. We, we get all of this data and the point is which ad should be shown to whom. We are trying to come up with models with that. <coughs> yes. So he is a... Session on that. I think they have uploaded that. Yes. So 
Rahul is a CPO of my company. He did an interesting session focused more on the application side of these models in advertising and in that world. So that video is all, all there on the Hasgeek TV. Yeah, anything else about Can you add to the funnel? Yes? Any, any add that video to the funnel? Yes, sure. Sure, I do that. In fact, I had a similar session on introduction to machine learning with R in Bombay. So you can contrast, you can take a look at that video contrast. So that had a slightly different approach. There I did not focus on using a real world data. I use inbuilt data sets given in R. And that had more discussion oriented uh, look to it. So you can take a look at that video also. All right, so all the code and all the presentation will be on the JIT repo. Please feel free to download if you find some bugs. If you are able to come up with better insights for those data sets, please you know, drop me a line. Yeah, thank you.